Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. We're letting people in. And then we'll uh, we'll continue with our venture into supercomputing. Okay, so we, we stopped, I think, at this slide, but um, that's not a bad part to start again. But first, um, if there's any questions already from what we uh, covered on Monday, um, feel free to, to ask them in the chat, and, uh, and we can address them now before we continue. It's probably easier. So any questions? There's a question, and it's, and it's a good question, and a deep question in a sense. Uh, how do you tell how long a job actually took to complete rather than just its estimated time? So uh, that's pretty simple uh, to know after the fact. So you, um, once you've uh, submitted your job, so once you've done s batch, you'll get a number. Um, and so that number, um, after, it, after you're done, you can use a special utility called SEFF. Um, let me see if I can demonstrate um, that. Uh, so once you've done SQ me, you'll see your numbers. I have nothing running right now, but uh, I will be. Okay. So once I've done, where's the S batch? I got scratch. What I call this intro? Yeah. Okay. So I guess my stuff. So I can do S batch. Uh, Looks like a different version. Let's copy it again. Uh, here. Okay. So I can S badge sweep. It gives me a number. And then once it's done, which I will know when SQ me gives me rather than RC or when it disappears. This is one of the funny things. Uh, if a job seems to just magically disappear, it, it means it just finished and the, the queue is no longer keeping track of it. But if you have the number, you can do SF and then the number of that job and it will give you how long it ran. Now this isn't very good as it says when it's still running. But when it is running, it will tell you how long it ran, uh, how efficient it was, how much memory it used. So that's kind of nice uh, after the fact uh, to know exactly how long it took. Um, on our other cluster on Niagara, at the end of the job in your output file, you also get a report of this uh, uh, slightly differently formatted with more, more details that also contains. So if you're doing sort of batch processing and you have lots of jobs, you don't want to have to do SF for every single one. At the end of the output file, uh, the Slurm file, uh, it will have that, that report uh, automatically on Niagara. Uh, there's another question. How does the number of nodes request, uh, requested affect the waiting time? And it's an excellent question, but it's, it's a little hard to say. Um, in principle, uh, it's easier to find a, for the scheduler to find a single node that is not used than to find two nodes that are not used at the same time. So ask for two nodes in principle, is a longer waiting time just because other jobs have to be done. Um, 
However, and, and so that's generally true, the, the, the more resources you ask, uh, the longer you'll have to wait for them to be there. However, there's other, uh, other considerations to take uh, that are used by the scheduler. Um, for instance, uh, how much you have used in the past. If you've used a lot in the past, then uh, that, that matters very little. Uh, so a user that asks for two nodes might get first, uh, run first, then a user that, has, that is asking for one node, just because that, that one node user has used a whole bunch of resources in the past. Um, the size of, this, of the, um, the request also matters a little bit on Niagara, where there's a, a skewing towards larger jobs, which is what Niagara is, is, is meant for. Uh, but on general purpose machines and on the teach cluster, that is not an effect. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about all the uh, the things that affect the waiting time. But uh, and there's no there's no hard way to say when it will run. It depends too much on uh, on what's being submitted, but also what's submitted after. Uh, and again, we'll we'll go into those those fair share details in a little while. Um, here's a, another question. Right. So th there's this distinction between uh, what we call login nodes and compute nodes. Um, and so uh, in the questions, it's called a frontal computer and a computing grid, but it, it, it's the same idea. Um, so there are in the teach cluster uh, about 40 something nodes. Uh, if you type as info, you'll actually, it will tell you about those nodes. Uh, some of them are idle. Uh, some of them have a, have some jobs running, and some of them are, are might, might be down. In this case, not, but that's good. Uh, so, uh, this these are the nodes that are available, and there's like about 42. But we also need a node for people to log into. So this this teach01, that's the first node of the batch, is is the node that you get onto uh, when you log in. But the other nodes aren't available for you. So if I try to say SSH to one of the other nodes, which would be called teach02. Uh, oh, sorry, I can't do that apparently, uh, but you can't do that because it's it's a compute node. So basically, we've closed off 41 of the nodes. So there is, in principle, very little, little distinction hardware-wise between a login node and a compute node. Um, but the idea is that the login node is where you uh, where you uh, prepare your job, and then you submit it to the, the scheduler, and then the scheduler picks one or more of the compute nodes which are set aside and runs your job on them so the scheduler is in charge of allocating the compute nodes uh, whereas the, the login nodes are just shared so if somebody is heavily using uh, the compute the sort of login nodes other users will, will 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 notice that because they're also on that same node uh, so that distinction is 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 uh, so you always try to prepare your jobs on the login node but if you want to say do a test to see how well it performs. Um, that is not very reliable on the login nodes, but there's a lot of people on it too. Um, but uh, so you'd have to submit a job to actually get, say, timing info. Uh, but for development, uh, it's it's convenient just to be able to log into a node, uh, the login node, and just start start working, and even trying to see if something works, regardless of how fast it is. Uh, so there's several. Uh, 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 yep. Yeah, okay. Which time to check in Ceph command outputs? Uh, so let's do this Ceph one more time. Um, so the main thing you are probably concerned with is the wall clock time. So wall clock, um, and we'll talk a little bit about it when we we look at parallelism. But it really means just the time it took from the start of the job. So a job gets submitted at some time say at noon, um, it sits in the queue because the system is busy and say it gets to run at uh, uh, half past 12 and then runs for half an hour until one. The wall clock time then is half an hour. So that's your main time, um, but uh, you will yourself probably be interested in how long the waiting time was, but in this case, and that's not what Seth reports, it just says how long it, it took. Um, and then also say how much of the CPU was used in that time, and as I said, it's here 0%, 0% because it's running. Um, now you could count time differently as well, because if you have a whole node and you have say 16 cores, if they're all running for half an hour, um, depending on how, how you run them, the operating system might say, not that it's a half an hour, 
but that it is eight hours because 40, 16 cores are used for half an hour. And so different measurements like the, the time command, for instance, which is a standard command in, uh, in Linux, so that's time, how long it takes to list this file, has different uh, numbers. The real one is again, the, uh, the basically the wall time, uh, but the user, the user one uh, counts all the cores separately. So if this is a, a parallel uh, process, it will be more than the real time. So the one you're you're usually interested in, though, is just the wall time. Um, yes, it's it's. I think it's hours, minutes, seconds. That's right. Uh, and then there's a, a, a question: if if uh, parallel is available, it is. A lot of this stuff in, in software is in module systems, um, and so so is the the. Uh, New parallel. So if you type module avail, um, you will actually get all the available modules, um, except, yeah, and um, new parallel is one of them. Here it is. So to get new parallels work, you'll need module loads, new parallel. Does it work now? It does. There we go. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, the code for today again is five. This, uh, the attendance code. Uh, don't forget to take the test. If you take two out of the three tests, uh, so the three, three tests being the Monday, Wednesday, and, and Friday, then that's enough to get credit. Plus, you also have to have uh, submitted an assignment. So, if you if you miss Monday for some reason, uh, I would suggest you look at the recording. Uh, but then, as long as you're here Wednesday and Friday uh, and do the assignment, you're fine. Okay. So let's see where we were with our uh, sort of prepared content. So we, we looked at this and I kind of this, did this just uh, on the fly as well, uh, how to get to the cluster. So I hope everybody's been able to SSH to the cluster. Uh, your username is this LCL underscore U of D, et cetera, um, at teach.signet.utomops.ca. That's the name of the machine. So, the, so this is not an email address. Don't type your email address here. It's not going to work. Don't try to email to this. It's also not going to work. It's just it's this index. Uh, you are a certain user on a certain machine. Um, I suggest you work on Scratch, CD Scratch, copy uh, this directory, uh, change it, change into that directory because that's where all the files are, and then you can try submitting the Scratch, uh, the, the sweep bond break. Um, and then we can see it running with SQME. It takes about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Um, depends a little bit on the file system and, and, and other parameters, but um, and then uh, once it's done, or even as it's going, it will create a file called slurm dash and then a number dot out. Uh, that number is a job ID. Uh, there's a way to change the name of the output, um, and I, I have done that at some previous version of the slides. That's why this sweep bond break output of txt is mentioned here. That's not not that's a mistake. Uh, you just want to look for a slurm dash star dot out. So let's look at what that actually did. Um, in a lot of cases, as I, as I explained on Monday, uh, the art of getting things to run faster is to use more cores. And to use more cores, you have to know what can run in parallel. But to know what can run in parallel, you have to know what you're computing. So let's look for a second at what we're doing here. So this is actually a simulation of a chemical bond breaking. So imagine there's a I don't know, a molecule, it has two atoms, A and B, and they are bound together. But uh, by thermal fluctuations, that bond can break. So the atoms, they, they fall apart again. Um, maybe it's, it's two uh, oxygen atoms. So we see uh, how O2 uh, dissociates. Uh, now, it's a model of that. Um, and so all the parameters don't really have any units. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a fictitious uh, model. But the way it works is that there's an, an energy associated with every distance between these two atoms. 
So that's called the bond extension. And then uh, if the bond extension is in a certain range, uh, the energy is a minimum. So this is a, uh, a stable situation, except uh, as it turns out, uh, if you extend this bond far enough, the two atoms go apart. And that is here uh, reflected by the energy actually being lower at larger states. So, so what happens, you can think of this as a particle uh, that is trapped in this, in this valley, uh, but, but is fluctuating because there's thermal motion. And then at some point it can escape over the barrier and go to its actual lowest uh, spot. And that's exactly what it simulates. So it's, it's a Monte Carlo simulation and that's all I will, I will say. But it's a Python uh, implementation of it. Uh, you can look into it if you're interested, but we're not going to go into the bond break application itself. Uh, we'll just be using it. And it's a very typical case of people running uh, uh, large parameter sweeps or, or uh, large cases, large uh, uh, samples of cases. Um, you don't really have to know how the application was created uh, for a lot, of, a lot of use cases. You just use the application for several uh, uh, samples and then you, uh, you analyze the output. So the way the simulation works, though, um, the, or the model works, is that uh, we want to know at what time this breakage occurs. So we, we start the, the, the module off and we want to know when it breaks apart. So we have to start simulating until it goes over the, the barrier. And in fact, if it crosses this point two, I think, is where the model says you've got a broken bond. So since it's random, the times at which that breakage happens is random. We don't know how long it takes. And in fact, we want to know how long it takes. So there's no good way to predict how long this will take. We'd have to try it. But also, since it's random, um, if we try it again and again, we'll get a different answer. And so we will actually want to sample this uh, and do a whole bunch of cases, uh, similarly prepared, but with diff different random numbers determining when the breakage is. Okay, so into the model part of, the, of this uh, go, the, uh, the point where we start the, uh, the bond, so I think that is somewhere somewhere in the middle here. And then we set a temperature. As I said, these fluctuations are due to, to temperature. So we set a temperature. And if the temperature is too, uh, too low, it will never escape. That's kind of how it works. That's the model, right? So the initial extension and the temperature basically set um, what kind of temp uh, times of breakage we can get. But within the simulation, we need to do some extra stuff. We need to also special, uh, specify uh, the time step. This is a time stepping algorithm. Um, we can't have a continuum of time computed because that doesn't even fit in, in a computer. So it takes time steps. How big they are is what we have to set. Uh, how long we're willing to wait. Since we do not know how long it will take, if we just uh, say, well, just take as long as you can, then this, uh, this program might well run for centuries. And that's not what we want. So we, we set some maximum time. We set a random seed. This determines what random numbers there are. And so this is, we want to change that to get different uh, samples. So that's basically how you draw different samples. Um, then uh, we want our output to go somewhere. So there's the name of an output file. Uh, we don't want to run, write the output every time step. That is way too much information. Uh, and we'll, we'll basically fill up our, our disk space for no good reason. So we have an interval at which we write our data. And then um, we'll have another file that we can write uh, log messages to. These will say things like the simulations has started, the simulation has stopped, uh, rather than just the output of the, of the data. So that describes the bond break, the, so the, the application. And um, you would put these parameters in your script. Uh, or uh, sometimes an application might take an, in, an input file and you put it in the input file. So the difference between out and log here is a little bit arbitrary. Um, but the output is going to be the bond extension as a function of time. So you'll get, so say it starts at one, then it'll say at time zero, it'll say one, then there's another row that will say at time uh, uh, delta t further, whatever the, the time step is, it might be at 1.2, et cetera. And it, but on top of that, there are messages that are printed out that say simulation has started or breakage has occurred or something like that. And the idea is that those are two different kinds because I might want to analyze just the data of x versus t, so the, the extension versus time, uh, separately. And so I don't want a file where all those messages, those, uh, those extra messages, are interspersed with the, uh, the data of the extension. So I have an extension goes in the output, 
the messages go in the log. That's the difference here. Um, if you want to know how to use a command, often in Linux, well-written commands uh, applications will have a help built in. Uh, we're, we're working on the command line, so there's no button that says help or uh, menu item says help. But in many cases, writing the, the application's name and dash says help will, will uh, print out a message that says how to use this and uh, as a small explanation in here too. So here it says, well, you should use this by typing the name of the application and then some options. And here are different options, which are just setting all of the uh, uh, all of these parameters that I just just mentioned. In fact, you don't have to specify all of them. There's defaults, uh, so that is nice. So if I don't say anything about the time step, it takes time step of 0.0003 uh, in, as I said, kind of arbitrary units. Um, probably think of them as uh, as picoseconds or something. But So there's two parameters that we are particularly concerned about. Uh, the temperature, that is the, the model parameter that we want to set and then say at this temperature, breakage occurs at this time. Um, and a random seed, which allows us to do, uh, by, by having different random seeds, will allow us to have different uh, trajectories, uh, random trajectories that, that will break at different times. So we could even uh, compute the, uh, the statistics of, of breakage times, histograms, averages, et cetera. Um, yeah. So that's typical Linux uh, uh, arguments for you. If you're not familiar with them, this is going to be like as soon as you start looking into Linux, they're all all uh, commands kind of have these formatters and the commands, and then these options starting with dash dash. And there might be some files or other things that don't start with dash dash, but the, the help will tell you that. Another way to get this help for um, system applications is the man page so man bond break doesn't work here because bond break isn't a system uh, uh, application but it would show you a, a, a typically a longer version of this okay so let's look at the job script then now that we know what bond break itself is doing and this is the job script that that uh, we submitted sweep underscore bond break dot sh and um and there's a few uh, different components uh, I, I realize it, this is a, uh, it's a bash script. Um, so if you haven't done much uh, Linux or bash scripting, a few things might seem unfamiliar, but I've tried to keep it relatively simple. Um, the first thing to note is that there's a line that says uh, exclamation, uh, pound sign, exclamation mark, slash bin, slash bash. Uh, pound signs are comments in, uh, in bash. Uh, so bash is the, the name of the shell that we're using on, uh, on the Twitch cluster. Um, and this identifies this file as being a bash shell script. If we don't say that, the operating system, and especially the, the, the scheduler, doesn't know what to do with this file. It's just a text file. So when you give me a text file, what am I supposed to do? Uh, this says, uh, run this text file and have it interpreted by bash. So then, uh, and, it, and bash is the same, the same uh, shell that we're using on the command line. So any command lines that we typed in, will work in uh, in this script. So we have to say this line, it's called the shebang. Um, and then there's a couple of other lines that seem to be comments, and they are for bash, but they're not for the scheduler. Uh, so uh, pound s badge with capitals uh, and no spaces in between the pound and the s badge allows us to give parameters to the scheduler. So what does the scheduler do again? It is in charge of uh, managing the compute nodes. And so it's in charge of allocating time and compute nodes to jobs. And so these are requests to, to just that aspect, just, just the scheduler part. We're asking for a single task, so that will need only one core, um, uh, which is a 16th of a, of a node for the teach cluster, for 20 minutes. These things are not bash. Right? Bash will not know anything about them because they're for the bash, they're just comment. But the scheduler, when we say as batch, will look for these lines and say, ah, I know what you what you want, and let me now put you in the queue and start looking for these resources. Okay. Once it's found those resources, it will run the rest of the scripts. So it's really two scripts at one in, in, in sense. It's a script that says what resources I want, and a script that then follows that says um, what I want to run on those resources. Okay. So the rest runs on an allocated compute node, but only once it's actually running. So when you type SQ on a busy system, uh, once you do uh, yes, then you will see that some of your jobs are PD, that means pending. 
Um, they're just waiting for other jobs to be finished so that your jobs can start. And there'll be a long list of other jobs that might be ahead of you. Um, so the rest only runs once, uh, once it's your turn, once SQ says running. Uh, and so what it does in this case is it loads a Python module. Uh, we are, this was a Python application and it's a Python 3 application. So um, you have to load that module. Otherwise, you just get the system Python, which in this case is still Python 2. So that won't work. Um, so we have Python 3 here. And then um, we set up some parameters by putting them in a variable t here. Uh, the only thing that is that is really of, uh, of great importance here is the temperature. The rest are all those um, default parameters that I talked about. Um, OK, so that's the temperature that's set. And then I'm going to have to do several random t. So the idea is I start at a certain extension, certain temperature, but then I take different random seeds to get different random paths that are hopefully breaking the, the bond. Um, and so that's, that's what this S is. S is a seed. Uh, this is one way to loop in a best shell. So basically, the, the value of S is running from 1 to, six, to, to 96. Um, and for each of those cases, um, I, I have it print out that it's doing a certain simulation of, of this, uh, the 96, so I can keep track of what's going on. And then uh, follow the bond break command. So it's bond break. Uh, that's just temp. The help file told me is how I specify the temperature. Uh, the temperature is dollar t. So whenever you use a variable in bash, you have to put a dollar in, in front of it. Uh, otherwise, it thinks it's a string called t. Uh, so it's dollar t. The seed can be set with dollar uh, dash s c dollar s. Um, I need more than that. Uh, so um, there's no more room on the line to specify these two. This slash at the end of a line in a script means continue the, the command. I'm not done with the command. It's a, a line continuation. Um, so it's important that it's here. It's already in the file so it, 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 uh, that you have, but that's kind of important because this is really just one big line. Uh, so the, the other commands, the other options are a file name and a log file name. So the file name is where the XT information extension versus time goes. And uh, the log file is where all the other messages go, like uh, the breakage time is also the log file. Uh, you might note that I put a directory here, out. So I want all of the output to go into a, a subdirectory called out. Uh, you might note that the file names depend on the temperature and on the, uh, and on the seed. Um, you want them to be different, because otherwise they will start uh, overwriting the old ones. Um, so you don't want that. Uh, and so that's, that's how this goes. Then this is done for 96 times, um, with the, the 96 times being the seed, um, different files. And now I'm just going to collect all of the breakage times. And I'm just using here that I know that those breakage times are on special or are, are in particular lines of the log files that contain breakage detected. So I'm not going to go into how, uh, how awk works. Awk is a fantastic command. Uh, you should go and, and read up on it. It can uh, find things in, in text files. It can change, it can uh, take those and interpret as columns and do all kinds of fancy things. Here we just want the times. And so this, this, if you will trust me, will take all of the breakage times from the log files and then uh, print them to screen. Yeah. Let's look at a few questions. Okay, so somebody has trouble typing bond break. So let's let's see. So you have to be in the right direction. If you type ls, there should be a thing called bond break. And then you have to, bond break itself turns out not to work because uh, Linux doesn't look in the current directory for, uh, for executables, at least not by default. Um, it looks in system directories and it's not in the system directory. The current directory is called dots. That's a shorthand for the current directory. And so if we say dot slash bond break, it will know that it should look for this command in the current directory. Um, now, if it says Python 3 no such file or directory, that means we don't have Python 3. Um, and as I said, Python, Python 3 is only in a module. So we have to do module load, sorry, module load Python 3. And then we can try one more time. And now it's running. It's, it's running with all these default parameters, which I don't really want. So there's a control C will stop the, uh, will stop this. Okay. 
Sorry about that. Um, yes. Let's see if there's any other questions. Yes. Okay. So when we submitted things, this was eventually run, actually pretty quickly run. We, uh, we should have gotten 96 uh, files in the out directory. And, uh, and then we also should get, excuse me, we should get the uh, results, uh, but where do they go? Uh, so if we print, if we run this on the, on the command line, which we can do, then R will print these breakage times to uh, to screen to the console and they would just pop up uh, when you're running as a batch job uh, we can't do that it's running on a on a compute node um, the compute node doesn't know where this this file uh, was submitted from where it came from uh, that you were connected from your machine uh, which means that you could actually disconnect once you've typed as batch and and the job would run anyway but as a result there is no console for it to write its messages to it just doesn't have that connection to any console it's just running uh, without any uh, any uh, screen or anything like that. So those messages should still go somewhere. They are now collected into a file. And that's that slurm dash uh, number dot out file. So, um, so that's why when we, are, when, when we submitted things, where was it here? At the end, once it's run, we're looking for the slurm dash number dot out files. And they should have uh, those that information. Let's see if I. So let's look a little bit more at what the scheduler does, and uh, now that we've seen this. Um, so we have a scheduler basically for fairness. There are a lot of compute nodes um, with a lot of users. Uh, we want them to be fairly sharing this resource. And so if you just open it up for users to log into and, and start running things, then whoever is the fastest and runs the most uh, will basically clog up the system and nobody else can do anything, which wouldn't be fair. Uh, and um, you would think that, oh, who would do that? We're, we're all colleagues, we're all nice. Uh, even if that were true, uh, you might make a mistake and accidentally run on all uh, 40 nodes where you meant to run on, say, four cores instead. Right? So, um, what we also can't do or could do, but it's not very good, is to say that we reserve cores for particular users. Uh, so uh, say we were we are about 40 people here and there's 40 nodes, so we could, could, could give each of you one node and go, well, that's it. Just use that node and you can't go anywhere else. And, and while that would be fair, um, it wouldn't be particularly productive because for a, lot, for a lot of cases, you're not actually computing anything on those nodes. And those nodes could have been used by somebody else. Uh, so um, we can't just reserve a part of the system for a particular user. Uh, we can't just open it up for everybody. Um, so instead, uh, we submit jobs. This, the jobs go into a queue, and the, and the scheduler is supposed to manage that queue such that um, uh, things are used fairly. Okay. That's why, but the, the, to be able to do that, um, the scheduler has, has to know how long you think your job is going to run, how many CPUs, so how many cores it needs. Um, if it needs GPUs, how many GPUs it needs. Uh, if it has particular memory requirements, uh, some systems, uh, you have to specify that too. And so only once it knows the, the, the resources requested, can it uh, complete this puzzle of, uh, of who gets to run where, or which job gets to run when and where. Okay. So that's the scheduler. Busy systems, you will have to wait. The teach cluster is a bit different because it's not a busy system. It's kind of on purpose because if you're trying things out in a, in a class, you don't want to have to wait for a day uh, to just make your point. Uh, but for, say, Niagara, typically you're waiting. Um, now, scheduling itself, especially for large clusters, is not, it's not an easy job to do. It's a, it's a big puzzle. Um, and so, it takes some time to figure this out. And what, uh, what happens in, to make this a feasible calculation, so itself is a calculation. And if you really try to do it 
uh, uh, for all jobs that are submitted, and we will have tens of thousands of jobs submitted in the uh, in the Niagara queue. Um, it it basically would would take longer to figure out where they should run than to just run them. So what it what the scheduler does is it, it basically takes the top uh, some uh, top uh, priority jobs and tries to schedule those, knowing that the, that already fills up the system and then looks at the at the next one. Uh, but even so, it takes some time. So every minute this calculation is done. But then once it's done and it finds a job, the job so it finds a node for that job. That node has to be inspected. Uh, if the node's no good, it has to be rebooted. That takes a few minutes. Uh, even if it's good, that check takes a little bit of time setting things up. So every time you run a job, it's not just running that, that bit of code in the job script. Uh, there's, there's overhead there. Right? So one of the things to make this uh, feasible uh, is to not have jobs that are too short. If jobs are too short, you basically are overloading the scheduler, and there is there's uh, the scheduler can't do its job. If you have a job that only takes a minute, if that were your only job, you wouldn't be running on a supercomputer. So it seems very realistic. And I think our, our minimum is currently at 15 minutes for a job. But that's if you had a single job that was a minute, you wouldn't run that on a, on a, a, a big cluster. But what if you had 100 of them, like we have here, um, you would want to run it on a cluster. But you can't submit them one by one. If you submit them by one, one by one, they are two small jobs too short of jobs for the scheduling to be efficient, and you're basically wasting resources. The whole point of having a shared system is not to wear, uh, not to do that. So instead, uh, now you have to use um, um, sort of a scheduler within a scheduler. You can ask for resources, say a node for uh, I don't know 12 hours or something, and say, well, within those 12 hours, I'm going to run sub jobs. So those little calculations that take a minute, but for which I have a many to do, I run them within that job. So I have a job, and that's sub jobs. And so one of the ways to do that is to use GNU Parallel, and we're going to talk to, about that later. Um, but that's that's sort of the uh, the, the game, and th and it really is you know or you're supposed to know a little bit about um, your computation, so you can, you can use GNU Parallel. Then the scheduler can just sort of do the the high level. Uh, distribution of resources. So there's a quite a few factors that go into this scheduling to make it fair. Um, first of all, one of the things that, that uh, Computer Canada organizes uh, every year is an annual competition for resources. Some uh, resource groups have a, a scientific um, Tasks to do scientific computation to do that that is large. It needs it needs a lot of resources, and those if we just had everybody submit to the queue, then those large resources would never get there. There would always be small users taking up nodes. Say you want say you need to run a hundred node uh, job. Um, if there's never a hundred nodes free, it'll be very very difficult to ever get anything done. So what happens instead is that there's there's a an allocation process. Uh, large uh, groups that need large amounts of compute or large storage ask for an allocation, and that is uh, that is basically given as a percentage of the system. So, um, say you we had a hundred nodes and uh, a group got an allocation for ten percent, then they'd get ten nodes. However, I already said that that is not really what you can do. You can't set those ten nodes apart, like aside from. Uh, the rest of the, the, the system because they would be often not unused and that is wasteful. We don't want that. Okay. It's all about, about not wasting anything. And by not wasting anything, the, the, the users, the researchers, uh, you guys uh, get as much stuff done as possible, right? Um, so that's, it, it, it's a win win. Um, how do you do that instead if you can't set aside those resources? Is by using priorities. So the list of possible jobs. Is each job is given a priority number, and then the highest priority ones will run. If if you are submitting from a uh, an account that has an allocation, your priority, the jobs of your priorities, sorry, the priorities of your jobs will be higher. So they'll be higher on the list, and that's fine. That will work um, uh, so that people uh, or groups that got an allocation will get to use something that is proportional to uh, their percentage. But it's a target, right? It's possible to not use it, 
and then you don't get it back because it was a percentage of the system. It wasn't uh, a banked amount. Also, to keep this fair, is that uh, that priority should go down once you've used some of it. So, say you have this 10% of the system, those 10 nodes nominally, though they're not real nodes, as you're using it, um, you're basically the priority goes down. And but it doesn't go down forever, it goes down for about a week or, or, or two weeks. Um, so, past usage is taken into account so that if the next group comes along and, and uh, have, hasn't run yet, that they get to use the system. So you can see it's a very dynamic system uh, where uh, priorities are changing all the time. Um, they're set by targets, percentages. Um, it's also uh, important that uh, they fit somewhere within the scheduling puzzle. So times of the jobs are important. If you have short times, the scheduler might find a hole for your job that, that to run where a node would otherwise not be used. Um, obviously, available resources matters. Uh, job sizes matter as well. On Niagara, larger jobs are giving a little priority. So there's a lot of factors that go in it, and uh, that makes it really hard to, to say, uh, predict when a job might run. It also makes it kind of clear why computing this priority and, and, and ordering things are quite uh, uh, a hefty computation for the scheduler to do itself, right? Okay, so knowing that that has to happen, um, here's you you submit to the to the to the scheduler and you sort of trust it. Uh, as a group, you will get as much percentage as as the target is if you keep submitting jobs. Um, if anything is ever wrong, you can you can contact support and and we'll see if anything is indeed wrong and if we can fix it. But uh, that's how it should work. But you have to specify things like uh, the amount of time that your job will take. So that's the dash dash time for short dash t, the number of nodes that you that you want, and the number of tasks you want. That determines what Slurm should be looking for. Or a uh, better way to say it is probably the number of tasks per node to 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 specify that and then. With, combined with the number of nodes, again, Slurm will know what to look for. Um, you might want to run uh, parallel tasks inside of uh, funded tasks, and then you have to specify the CPUs per task. You might want to specify that you need some GPUs. So there's another flag for that. You might need to specify what the memory is, although on the Teach cluster and on Niagara, um, you just get all the memory anyway. So that, that is not effective. But on, on many systems, you have to say how much memory you want so that Slurm isn't just carving out time and nodes, but also also memory. So it's, a, it's a 3D puzzle. Okay. So those are parameters for aspects that you can give. You say, this is, this is what my job needs. Um, as you already saw, you can put those parameters in the job script by using pound aspect uh, uh, line. So those, those comment lines that are really not comment lines for Slurm. They are, they are information for the scheduler. Uh, and that's also the best way to do it. You want to specify these things in the job script so that you don't forget what you asked for. If you type it on the command line with these parameters, you can do that, but the command line is gone. There is a history, but it's finite. And it, it's better to have everything just in your job script so it's self-documented uh, what went on when you submitted the job. Okay, so um, there's a question whether these parameters overwrite what you already have in your script. So this is a little bit tricky. Slurm is a little bit tricky in some spots. If you specify it in two spots, um, so on the command line and in the script, then I think the command line trumps it. Um, the best thing to do, though, is to make sure you do not uh, do that. You only specify it in one, in one spot, because there's also environment variables that you can set um, that then uh, trump what's in the scripts, but not what's on the command line. Really, I don't, I don't want to think about what priority uh, exists when I have the parameters specified at different spots. So I, I just, I myself only put these parameters in, in the job script, uh, never on the command line, and, and never in a, an environment variable. And then I know that there's only one spot to look for what happens or what I ask for. It's the job script. Um, you might like uh, a different approach, but I would still highly suggest just having one spot where you specify it so you actually know what's going on. Um, yeah. A good question, whether the dash T amount of time 
includes the waiting time, and that is not the case. So waiting, you don't. So this is just the time it will take for your job. It doesn't include the waiting time. Um, it would be uh, uh, hard to do that because you can't really predict what the waiting time is. So it'd be almost impossible to give the right amount of time to sperm. So there. So it also means that these jobs do not expire. So if you ask for a, a one hour job in dash T, if it hasn't run in one hour because the cluster was busy doing something else, the job it doesn't disappear. It's still in the in the queue. It, that one hour will only start counting when you uh, when it starts. Um, and likewise, uh, when the job is running and it asks for one hour, but it's done after a half an hour. So it, basically the script is, is the, the final line of the script is, 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 is reached. Uh, then Slurm will just notice that your job is done and it will, it will no longer, it will basically stop your job. It's already done, it's done everything it's supposed to do and release that node or that core or whatever resource to, uh, to the pool and, and have something else run on it. And so you're only, uh, so, so that job after the fact counts as just having run half an hour rather than the whole hour. And, and in that sense, it's also safe if you're not quite sure how long something takes to give it a little bit extra time. The more accurate you are, the better the scheduling is. Uh, but obviously you don't, you, want, you don't want a situation where your job takes an hour and a minute and you set an hour and it crashes after, uh, after that. So that. That would be unfortunate and, and a bit wasteful. There's a question, this, this gets tricky sometimes. Uh, if you want, say, two nodes and you want different numbers of tasks per node, uh, this, it's an uncommon thing. Um, you'd have to have a really good reason to do that. Uh, there's two things you can do. Um, if you really don't care where the jobs are, you just basically want an overall nine tasks over two nodes, you can just say that's just n tasks, tasks nine and the scheduler will divide it in four and five. Um, if, it, if there's a reason for four and five, um, you might have to build your own host uh, host list uh, that specifies what host you run on and how many uh, processes per host. Uh, so that, that gets tricky. That's not really a, a, a slurm thing. Um, that's more of a how do I run my jobs thing. So, excuse me. Yeah. Hello. Bruno saying there is an option that's just distribution where you, you can do this kind of stuff uh, as well. So that's good. So. OK, so we've seen the job script. Um, it was written in bash, which is really the, the, the Linux command line for the supercomputer. Um, we've seen a, an application that was written in, in Python, although we're, we're not actually looking at it. Um, and so one doesn't program a supercomputer just in the bash language. Um, that's uh, for a number of reasons. But oftentimes, your, your core application is written in a programming language that is, is, depends on what your, uh, your field and what your, your uh, particular computation needs. But it's going to be written in some sort of programming language that has to be translated into machine code. The computer can execute machine code. It can't execute Python. It can't execute C++. It can execute machine code. And so if you're looking at how you program a, a supercomputer, there's different options to do that. Um, and roughly speaking, one can divide programming languages in, in two types. Um, it's not ent entirely uh, as clear cut. but one has compiled languages like C++, uh, Fortran, uh, also CUDA, um, that um, do this translation from uh, their, their languages, or C++, for instance, to machine code once, then, then create what you would call an application, an executable file. And that executable file can be run uh, and basically contains the machine code already. So it runs directly. There's no further translation uh, needed uh, as the as the code is running, as the, as the application is running, so the code becomes an application. The application is running pretty much directly. Uh, this is uh, this is useful. Uh, the the opposite uh, of that is a scripting applications or scripting languages like uh, Bash, Python, and R, 
where in principle, what is done is you have your code, sure, but it's really a, a bunch of lines uh, that are translated into machine code, uh, one way or another, line by line. So there's a line that says something like A equals five. That, that doesn't mean anything in machine code that has to be translated, uh, has to be interpreted. Um, it, so say Python does that, and then looks at the next line and does exactly what, it ha what happens, okay? Um, there, the first one, the compiled languages, tend to be way more efficient when running um, for two reasons. Um, one is the compiler analyzes a whole code. So it doesn't do just one line and, and does exactly what it says. It, it looks at multiple lines and it might realize that certain things can be done in a different order more efficiently. Uh, certain things might be skipped. Uh, it, it has the, uh, the mandate or, or the allowance of changing your, what is actually done by the computer as long as the effect is the same. And since the compiler knows uh, computer chips way better, or at least the people writing the compilers know the, the chips way better than, than you, um, this tends to be a, a much faster code. And, it, and, it, and there are certain optimizations that you can only see are possible when you have multiple lines at a time. So that's something that's missed in, say, Python and R. Um, but also, in Python and R, um, the fact that every time you run your code, you have to reinterpret these lines um, means that that's, that translation is done all the time. So if you're running the same code many times, um, there is a penalty. Um, you could imagine that you, know, you, have, you have your compilation, you have, so C++ is compiled once and then run. You still have that overhead in the compilation step, but it's once. Uh, whereas for Python and R, you, you hit it more, more often. Uh, there's a third reason, which is these are dynamic languages, but I'm not going to go into why that is extra overhead. But that's the difference between scripting and, and compiled languages. Now, uh, that would mean that if you want to run a supercomputer, you would think, well, you obviously have to use compiled languages. You want to be as fast as possible. Um, however, um, they tend to be a little bit trickier to, to, to write code in, in the sense that the development of, of these dynamic languages like Python R, it, or it, developing code in them, is, is considerably faster and easier uh, than, uh, than C++. Um, if things go wrong, it, you can try things interactively in Python and see why they break. Whereas in, in C++, if something doesn't compile, um, it can be a bit of a hassle to figure out why. So, Productivity can be bigger in Python and R sometimes than in, say, C++ or Fortran. So it is a balance. Okay? And that balance gets changed also by whether you use uh, packages in Python and R that are themselves written in, say, C++ or Fortran. So for instance, NumPy and SciPy have big parts of them written in, in C++ and Fortran. And uh, the same for R, by the way. Um, and so that they aren't as, as slow as you would expect if they were just pure uh, pure scripting applications. And, and where that, that balance lies depends a lot. So, um, so it's, not, it's not always the case that this is so bad to do scripting languages, but you will find that very computationally heavy codes will, will be written in compiled languages. Any, any questions about how we're, so I'm not going to obviously teach any of just compiled languages here, but um, any questions about this so far? It's a bit of a discussion in the chat I see about, uh, about what Slurm is. Um, So the scheduling itself is that's a process that has to be done, and there's different implementations and different uh, uh, schedulers out there. Uh, Slurm is one of them. Uh, if, you, if you Google Slurm, you'll find uh, its documentation. Uh, there are other ones. Um, um, PBS is an old one that's still used. Um, we've, got, we've got Torque. Um, so. It, within computer, the computer camera systems, they're all, they're all running Slurm. Um, there are differences in what is possible in each, uh, in each cluster. So if you're running on one of these clusters, things that are possible on, say, uh, the cluster in Waterloo, Graham, uh, like specifying how much memory you want, doesn't work on Niagara because you always get all of the memory anyway. So there's, uh, but those are 
um, policy differences. There are not differences in the scheduler itself, per se. Okay, so let's look then at parallelizing a bash script. So we have this bash script. Um, it ran in parallel, ran about 20 minutes. Um, we're going to want to do that in parallel. Uh, we have multiple cores, but the way it's written, it's doing every one of these bond break computations at once, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So we really have almost 100 uh, computations here uh, that are done one at a time. So we often suggest, if you're in this kind of a case where you have uh, separate computations that are independent, remember, they all write their own output files. Um, they don't communicate with one another until at the very end, we're just collecting all those times. Um, we have this almost embarrassingly parallel situation where they could all run at the same time. However, uh, we also have the situation where they take different times. Um, if, you, uh, and then if you look at the outputs after 20 minutes of running of when the bond breaking time was, although that is expressed in, uh, in the fictitious units that are used in the simulation, you would see that there's a large variation of them, which means that they all run at different times. And that makes it a little harder to uh, to parallelize in that what we could not, what we should not do is to take this, these uh, 96 cases and submit them as six jobs of, uh, of uh, 16 cases. Uh, so do 16 of them at the same time, each of them on, a, on one of the four, say, of, of a node, and another 16, and another 16, because we'd have this load imbalance uh, situation that we, uh, that we discussed before. Instead, what we want to do is this situation where uh, we start 16 jobs if you have 16, uh, 16 cores, right? Uh, already, I should call them sub jobs because we have, we, we have now a node. And then within that node, the node, sorry, let's sorry, backtrack. We have a job, say the job asks for 16 cores. That is one job of 16 cores. That's a sort of a scheduler job. Within those, that job, I can run things on the separate nodes, so it's subdivided, them, and that's why I call those subjobs. Knuperl itself uh, uses uh, the term jobs because it doesn't know there's a layer of, of slurm jobs on top of it. Uh, so, but just for for you know accuracy, when I say jobs, I mean a job in the scheduler, so a reserved bit of resources reserved by the scheduler, and then within that, I can run more than one task if I ask for more than one course. And those tasks I will call subjobs. Okay. So it's a, now the Perl itself is really just a script. It's written in Perl. Perl is also a scripting languages, and it's it's pretty good for text uh, uh, analysis. Uh, but in any case, it doesn't really matter what it's written is. What it does is what matters, and it's it's very versatile. It can do a lot of things uh, to help you effectively and efficiently run in parallel. Uh, 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 computations that are independent. So you first need to load a module to get it, module load new parallel, uh, and then the command itself is parallel. If you ever use new parallel, um, you should cite the, uh, the, the original uh, publication. So this is here in uh, below. If you want to know about how to use it, um, I strongly suggest looking at the, uh, the tutorial. The link is here as well. Um, so let's look at an example. It's always easier to see. Uh, let's just look, look at the right here. We have um, not the same task as we did before, but a, a simpler task where uh, we're going to use new parallel to run things in parallel. So again, I have um, as batch commands, I'm asking for one node and 16 tasks per node. So this is a full node. Um, I'm asking for one hour of time. And I've given this job a, a name. It's another uh, slurm. Uh, option you can give, and I'm calling it new parallel x16. Um, I uh, imagine here I'm running a application that needs these modules Intel and GSL. It doesn't really matter if they do it or don't. Uh, but what is important is to load this new parallel uh, module. And then we, once I've done that, so so uh, once it's running, it will load these modules, and then I can use the parallel command. And one of the things that I can ask parallel to do is to run a set of commands. Here's a set of commands. Um, and every line here is a separate command. So it, the first command changes the directory to some job tier one, uh, then runs an app 
called that uh, dot dot dash app dot dot means it's actually in the, uh, the parent directory and then uh, writes out I got job one is done so that is one job another job does pr pretty much the same thing except runs it in a different directory and we imagine here there's like 200 of them okay so I have 200 lines I put them on the line here and I this EOF stuff uh, is a way to feed these lines into the parallel command um, what I'm also doing here is specify how many tasks I want to run at the same time. So what Parallel is going to do with these 200 jobs is take a certain number of them and start running them simultaneously, right? Knowing that there's multiple cores that will, 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 will take up that task. Um, and then say in this case, there's 16 of them. So 16 of them are, are running. And then whenever one is done, it takes the next line in the list and starts executing that on, on whatever core was free. So that's how we do load balance. The dash J flag here says how many tasks per node we would run. Normally, you would want to run as many tasks as you have cores in your node. So we have uh, one node here. Node had 16 cores. Um, we're asking for 16 tasks. Um, that does mean that Parallel will actually, by default, use 16 for this parameter. Uh, but we could also set it to less or even to more, just to sort of play with that if you wanted to. Um, if you're running this new parallel command, for instance, on your own machine, and you're doing some other work as well, you might not want it to use all of your cores. So you would set this parameter to something smaller, like just, you know, dash J2 or something, two things running at the same time. Um, that's what this parameter does. Okay, now this is one way to run it, and it's 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 easy to understand because each line is done separately. So each line is just a, a command. And by the way, in in Linux, semicolons uh, they separate commands themselves, but in this case, they are all. This, so the line separation is 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 used by GNU Parallel, um, uh, and the semicolons are just there so that each of these lines can have multiple commands in this case. Um, there's other ways to do this, um, and we'll look at a few ways later. But um, just to reiterate, GNU Parallel is sort of a, a scheduler within a scheduler. We've asked a Slurm for certain resources, and it gave them to us, say, 16 cores. And now it's GNU Parallel's task to make sure that those nodes are, those cores are used um, uh, as much as possible. As long as there's sub jobs available, it will keep uh, the cores um, busy. And so we're we're effectively load balancing in this way. Um, it has a lot of uh, uh, other features. It can run on multiple nodes if you want to. It's not always very beneficial, but you can. Um, but by default, it runs on a single node. Um, it can write a log record of all the sub jobs that it has done. Uh, it can keep track of those that have failed. Um, there's a resume uh, option where you can have it try again uh, those jobs that failed for some reason. It keeps track of access status, etc. Um, so it, it's it's uh, it's a useful um, utility. So just going back to the EOF, there's a question here. So let's just go back here. So if I don't, if I just have the command and I stop it at uh, at this point, right before the first EOF, uh, what that does is it it will put GNU Parallel in a mode where it's ready to uh, execute multiple sub jobs, but it's waiting for us to type them in. Uh, obviously, that's not going to work if we have this batch job because it's running on compute node. It's not attached to a console. There's no way to type them in. It's not what we want anyway. Um, this EOF stuff is a batch way or a Linux way to uh, basically um, emulate typing in the, the, the commands. So this is as if I typed in these commands and then GNU Parallel um, reads them in. It's, 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 a, it's a here doc, or there's other names for it too, but that's basically what this does. So anything between the lesser than lesser than EOF and the EOF, EOF uh, will be uh, basically simulated uh, um, keyboard input. It's not the most elegant way to do it, but it is an easy way to see what's going on. As I said, each line is exactly what's done for each sub job. So it's an easy way to get started. Um, but that's, that's, that's the magic here. 
yeah, so you could put these ones in a text file as well. Um, and then uh, rather than doing EOF, you just do lesser than and then the text file's name. That's another way to do it. This is nice because it's all in one in one spot. Um, yes, it also means that if you do it this way, you have to type in two or not commands where you can obviously see that there's a pattern here that changes. So again, I will I'll say how you how you could generate these commands rather than having to type them in. Uh, but the effect will be the same. There'll be a template. It will generate effectively these lines for you and then execute them, uh, uh, basically slurm task per node uh, at a time. So a few a few common and, and uh, arguments for Comparel is the dash j command or the dash jj dash dash jobs uh, option that sets the number of no simultaneous jobs. By default, it's just the number of cores. Um, there's a log file you can write to. Uh, so that's different from the log files that these, these applications run to the, write to themselves. This is a new parallel log file that keeps track of all the sub jobs. Um, so I would always recommend uh, using this because if anything goes wrong with your job, uh, that will tell you, say, say there's a power outage, for instance, and only like, uh, you know, 20 of the 200 jobs are done, rather than having to see which one produced output, I can just look at the job log file and see which ones were done. Uh, so it's it's very convenient. Or if something else went wrong, um, the job log gives you all that information rather than having to dig out uh, that in other ways. Um, if you've done that, uh, you can even resume afterwards. So you just take the same log file, uh, resume it, and it will try and run the other 180 cases. I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, explain dash test pipe exactly, but it, it can be useful sometimes. Um, there's a question. Uh, what's the difference between nodes equals one and n tasks per node equals one? Um, if you use one task per node, um, will it take more nodes? Yeah, so so Slurm's kind of funny. Let's just go here. Um, in this case, test test nodes means I want to run only on one node. And number of tasks per node says how many tasks I want to run on that node. So for the teach cluster, this is a perfect fit because the nodes have 16 cores. And so uh, Slurm will go, well, if you need 16 tasks, you will need 16 nodes. Since you want only one node, I guess I have to look for a single node and give the whole node to this job. Um, if I ask for number of tasks per node being eight and node is one, then um, what I would get is essentially half a node. Uh, so I, so Slurm would put this on on uh, uh, on a node. It gives eight of the cores to that job. But the next job, say of another user that is also asking for eight tasks per node, would land on the same node. So now you're sharing the node. Uh, the cores are separated in in terms of utilization, but you're still you could see each other's uh, commands and not in detail, but you could see what is running. And you'd see there's somebody else running on the node. Um, so you're basically sharing the node, but dividing the resources. Um, if you ask for two nodes and 16 tasks per node, then you would get 32. But if you ask for two nodes and say uh, 32 tasks, sorry, 16 tasks, then what it really says is that take one or two nodes and run some of the tasks from one node and some of the other, and it doesn't have to be distributed. Um, so it's 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 a uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of difficult to to uh, to put it in in very plain terms. So using more nodes and less tasks per node is almost never a good idea unless. Um, those tasks need a lot of memory. So mention that you try to run these 16 tasks on two nodes. The task, each of the tasks takes a single core. So it means that eight of the cores of, of both nodes are not doing anything. And the other eight cores are running as fast as they did it before. Like it's not speeding anything up. So, it's, it's, so in almost all cases, you just want to use all the cores of the node. Um, in fact, in, uh, on Niagara, so not on the teach cluster, on Niagara, the only way you can request jobs is by whole node. 
So you ask for a number of nodes and you always get the whole node, which means 40 cores. Uh, you can't ask for a half, uh, half node, you get a whole node anyway. Uh, there's never sharing. So it's a much, in a sense, a much easier way to think about it. You say, how many nodes do I need for how long? Uh, rather than also have to think of how many tasks will I run. Once you have your node, you have 40 cores and you do with it whatever you want. Uh, do you want to run 20 applications at a time because they take a lot of memory uh, and so 40 won't fit? Or you want to run 80 because there's some uh, magical way in which that's faster than 40? Uh, all of that is up to you. For general purpose clusters and for, for the teach cluster as well, it's more flexible. So there, it is possible to share a node with another job if you don't need as many tasks, which makes it uh, uh, easier to be used for smaller jobs and, and with more users, right? But it means that we have to really be careful on how we specify our, our arguments. Yeah, so, the, so indeed, uh, the, there's so many remarks. If you ask for 16 jobs and you make your parameter uh, that follows this J into five, you're basically wasting 11 cores. And that's true, exactly. Um, now, yes, that would be wasteful, except, as I, and I, I said that already, if those five tasks fill up the memory of the node, then there's no more room memory-wise to put a sixth one. So you're maximizing memory usage uh, utilization instead of CPU utilization, which is still a very valid thing to do, right? Uh, you're still maximizing your throughput, your output, um, by, by asking for as much of the resources, as much parallelism as will fit. If it doesn't fit, what would happen is that your jobs crash and you don't get anything. So, uh, so it's still as efficient as possible. OK, so let's look at uh, a slightly nicer way to have uh, to use new parallel where we don't have to type 200 lines of, of basically the same code, which is error prone because at some point you're going like, to, if you actually type these, um, you're, you're, you're bound to make a mistake. If you write a script to generate it, which is not a way you could do, then you're, well, there could be an error in that script. So let's see what, what new parallel has because it has some ways to, to generate commands like that using replacement strings. So um, when you, well, let's first look at, yeah, this case. So in the replacement string, the basic one in new parallel is two curly braces. So let's look at this example that we had before. We have 200 lines. They all say CD job dear and then some number, run the application and then say that the job is done. We can take that as a, as a template and give it as the first argument to, to parallel, replacing that number by curly braces. And if I stop there, if I press enter, it would now uh, still wait for, uh, for user inputs, but those user inputs would just be the replacement strings. Okay. So what happens is that when it reads in one, it takes that one and creates a job, a sub job that does um, the specified template with curly braces replaced by one and then by two and then by 200. So that is uh, at least a lot that's less timing, the uh, typing, sorry, um, and, and uh, less errors. If there is an error, none of them, they all break. So that's kind of you know, better than some of them break. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what curly braces here do. Um, they, they are replacement strings, but they still need input of, uh, of what those curly braces should be replaced with. Um, but that's, that's, that's one uh, improvement. There are other replacement strings. So uh, say this was a list of file names and they have a name and an extension, then there's ways to, uh, to just ask for the extension, just ask for the file name as a replacement string to make sort of more flexible ways of, of creating a, a sub job command. Um, but we can go one step further. And rather than having, again, these, these 200 simulated uh, keyboard inputs, um, basically, we can, we can write those also on the command line. So um, the parameter here, this curly brace, can be also specified um, behind three colons. So colon, 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 triple colon. And then following that should be all of the cases that it should do. Space separated 
Um, so uh, one is a case, two is a case, three is a case, four is a case. So these two are exactly equivalent. Um, and But now rather than the uh, bash shell or Linux emulating keyboard input to parallel, parallel now reads these in themselves. So there's no, it's a bit, uh, it's, it's more native to parallel, to no parallel. Uh, so that's that's nice um, in that it is a little bit more compact. Uh, the syntax is a bit more uh, pure in in some sense. Uh, this would work in other shell scripting language too. If you ever switch to another scripting language, you could still execute this. That doesn't have the EOF. Um, and then uh, that's great too. So this is sort of shell independent, uh, but I still don't like it too much. There's still 200 numbers I have to have to specify. So there is now um, a way to, to generate expressions like these. But again, that is now dependent on your, on your programming language, so bash. So for bash, for instance, I can generate uh, the numbers 1 to 300 on a line with this curly base dot dot notation. So that works for, uh, for bash. And we're using bash here anyway. So I'm just going to pretend that this is a, a standard way to do it. So the whole thing is also equivalent to parallel CD job with all these curly braces, um, and then triple uh, colons, and then 1 to 200, which expands into 1, 2, 3, until 200, which is then given to parallel. There's a question why we need the, the quotation marks. And that is, uh, that's a good question. Um, and it's, it's a Linux question, really. Um, what we should give to new parallel as an argument is the template as basically as a string, if you want. Um, but it has to be just the, the, the single argument that we give. If we don't have quotation marks here, then not so much parallel as Linux itself says CD is one argument, job dear curly base is the next argument, et cetera. So it starts splitting up this into separate arguments and, and New parallel gets confused about that. So we need to uh, put it between quotation marks to say that this is one thing. This is one command, put it between quotation marks. Um, and uh, and then you, there's a difference between single and, and double quotation marks, which isn't so important here, but there's, there's, there's a slight difference. But you can use double quotation marks inside single quotation marks. Uh, so that, that's kind of what we're doing here. OK. Okay, so once we have this sort of expansion of, of lines, um, there's another technique that is very useful if you have more than one argument. So we have one parameter here, it runs from one to 200. What we, if we had two, one that runs from one to 10 and one that runs, runs from say zero to 200, uh, we can have actually multiple um, of these substitution variables uh, by having multiple uh, triple colon specifications. And, and okay, so there's a question, and I think we have to go back for a second. What is parallel? So, parallel is the command that belongs to GNU parallel. Okay, so when we have, and it's, it's a script, but what it does, so it's not bash, it's not something uh, that is just automatically how you parallelize things by saying parallel. It's a command, it's a script that is written, it's an application. And that application, that script, this parallel script, is able to launch multiple other applications at the same time. Okay, so what? So, when one step back, um, more steps back. Remember when we were? Oh, yes. When we're running here, parallel is just a script that takes some input, and that uses that to create subjobs. In this case, two hundred. Okay. And then one of the features of this script is that it can run them in parallel with Slurm task per node at the same time. Okay, so parallel is just a script. And it's only available if you say module load new parallel on the teach cluster, then you have this parallel command. And the parallel command is a sub job generating command. And so I, we specify a sub job that we want to do, and, in, and right now where we're at is that we're doing 
uh, generations, of, uh, generating these sub jobs based on a template and then a substitution. And uh, yes, so the substitution, so, and now we can have multiple uh, arguments here, multiple substitutions. Um, so what this particular command does here, it is, it's generating sub jobs that it will doing, are doing echo something and something else. Uh, the first something is a second parameter. So it takes one of the techniques here and the first one takes some of them here. Um, I've also just, now these curly braces are purely bash. They're not parallel, they're, they're bash, um, which means that it might not work in other scripting languages, but they are very handy, so I use them all the time. Um, so the first one makes sense. It's like one to 10, it, it generates one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Um, the second one generates uh, values from zero to 200, but with steps of 50, that's what this notation means. So you've got zero, 50, 150 and 200. So it really is just five cases. So it's a way to do a stepping. It only does integers. Um, so I don't even think, I'm, I guess it might do negative numbers. I've not tried that, but, um, but you know, that's, that's, that's what it does. If there's any questions before we go hands on. Okay, so hands on assignment. So this is the assignment, and the, the, the timing is pretty good. Um, I've given you the sweep bond break uh, file. So it it and it does exactly what you what was mentioned here. It's it asks for one task for 20 minutes, loads Python, sets the temperature, runs with this for loop. Uh, you see this curly brace notation here too, at some purpose. Um, uh, this, this expands into one, two, three, 69. That's kind of how it works. Uh, and then uh, here's the, the actual commands. Um, they each produce their own log file, remember. So those log files are all called out slash uh, temperature, temperature uh, dash something else. Um, and so it's just looking for the breakage times from there using this all command. Um, if you want, and if, it, if, it's, if it's confusing, try this out on the command line, but change the number of cases to say two or something and just type this in and you'll see it's sort of happening live. Uh, so that particular script, um, we want you to modify. So this is an unparalyzed script. Every case runs after the previous case has stopped. We want them to run at the same time on a single node of the teach cluster using all 16 cores. So what I've given you in these, in these slides and in these, in, these, in these two lectures should be enough at least to, to, to get it going. So you have to change the job script so that you get 16 cores, but you also have to change the script itself so that instead of this for loop, um, you have a GNU parallel command that does the sweep for you. There's not one right answer. There's multiple ways. You could use the EOF uh, technique if you want. Um, what you cannot do is type in by hand in a keyboard, but uh, other than that, you can pretty much do anything you want. Um, and, but that's, that's the task. Then uh, submit that new script to the scheduler. You probably want to make it a new name and then time both of them. Time the, the, the first one, which should be about 20 minutes. And then this uh, paralyzed version should be faster. Uh, so, so how much speed up are you getting using 16 cores uh, versus just having it run? And as I, as I, uh, I think already mentioned, if you have any questions, and we will take some questions now too, but uh, if you have any questions uh, before Friday, um, ask them in the forum or, um, um, yeah, that's probably the best way. You can, you can email also if you, uh, the, the questions on the forum are public. Uh, not, you, you can only answer the forum if you're logged in and, and registered, but you know, they're visible. Um, but that's a good place to do it because other students can also sort of give you tips when maybe we might be asleep. Um, once you're done with that, um, take the script and put it into the assignment Dropbox. I'm just gonna show where that is. So the assignment Dropbox is on the website right here. And um, I have a different view than you, you, you guys because I'm the instructor, but when you click on it, you can click on the assignment and I won't do it, but then it will give you an upload uh, possibility of your file. So yes, you'll have to figure out how to get your scripts from uh, 
from the teach cluster back to your own uh, your own machine before you can upload it here. Um, look up the slides where I say how you use S copy or um, you know use some other copy paste. Uh, no no screenshots. I won't accept screenshots because I can't really know for sure that the characters that I see are the characters that are in there. Um, so I do want a text file. Um, and if you can, it's output. So that is the slurm dash something output. I don't want the uh, the X versus T. That's too big. Okay. Try to submit this by midnight on July 9th. Um, just so that is it ninth? Seven. I don't think I did that right. Eight. Sorry. So by Thursday night. If you do, I can look at it in the morning of Friday, and we can discuss um, some common. Uh, features and common common mistakes and the solutions to them on Friday. Any questions? Do we need to only write the scripts or do we need to write it on the super? Yes, so you have to write it on the supercomputer and run it there because otherwise you can't know how much longer it, it takes. So if you submit it to the scheduler, that can only work when you're on the teach cluster. Um, if you want to edit on the Tish cluster, um, there's many, many different ways you can do this. Uh, you can edit on your own machine and copy it over. That is, that is for a lot of people the comfortable way to do it. Just keep in mind that if you're doing that on a Windows machine, um, you might have to use a utility called DOS to Unix uh, on your scripts to make it a Unix text file. If you're doing it on the Tish cluster uh, and you just want a simple text editor, uh, try nano. The command nano and then a file name will, will give you a very basic uh, text editor. What's nice about it is it doesn't need graphics, uh, but on the bottom here, it gives you all of the commands that you can do. So once I type something to know how to save this file, I just look below and says there's a head O, head is control. So control O will allow you to write a file. How do I get out of here? Control X. So all of the commands are in the bottom, which is if you if you've not worked on a command line editor before, is a an easy way to 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 overcome that uh, that hurdle. If you like Emacs, you can use Emacs. If you like VI, you can use VI. Um, we don't have a VS Code on here, um, but it might even be possible to use VS Code remotely. Don't ask me how to set that up though. Um, all that matters at the end of the day is that there is a text file on the Teach cluster that you could as batch. If you do something wrong, Asbatch will give you all kinds of hints of what's wrong. Uh, this one doesn't look like a batch script, for instance. Great, it's not submitting now. Um, that's, uh, yes. Try to use the teach cluster. Like it, you might have access to another cluster like Graham or even Niagara just so that the timings you get are compatible with the timings that other people get. Um, definitely submit on to the same cluster as well. It's true that they probably work on Graham uh, just, just as well. Um, so you might even want to see how much faster Graham is than the Teach cluster. Teach cluster is a lot older, uh, should be slower. Um, but, uh, but for just so we can say uh, my, my application took like one minute to run and somebody else says five minutes, that the difference isn't because we're on different machines. So um, we've set things up so that they will work on the teach cluster. The, not, the modules you might need to load on Gray might be different. And so we don't really want to, uh, uh, to make things more complicated. Any other questions? So what you should submit is two, really two files. You can either bundle them up or just do the two. So the scripts would be whatever your uh, your version is of the sweep bond break. So whatever this becomes, and maybe by another name, upload that. And then um, when you do your slurm submits, you will have gotten the slurm output, right? That file, we want that file too, because it will actually give you, um, show that there's actually results. Um, 
ideally, it'd be nice if you could also add a note that says how long uh, the original took and the new one took. Uh, but those two files, the, uh, the, the job script that does the parallel computation and the output of the job script or the slurm output of the job script, those are the two files that we want to see. If you're using an auxiliary file, so for instance, you use new parallel where you stream in another file, you should include that file also. Like anything that we, we would need basically to reproduce uh, uh, the run, not that we're going to run all 50 probably, but so we can see what's going on, it's just submit that. You can submit as many files as you want. Um, as I said, please don't try to submit the output files that just way too, too, too big to be useful. But uh, you can submit one file and then an hour later the next file um, that's that's totally fine. There's no final submission button or anything like that. Ah. <laughs> yes. Okay, you get out of less with Q. Um. More questions. As I said, you can ask questions later in the forum too. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that as well, and uh, or bring them to Friday. But uh, just you know, try your hand on this. The, even just submitting the the serial code shouldn't be too bit too difficult. And then just try filling around with new parallels. See what happens. The nice thing is the teach cluster is just dedicated for teaching. So you might submit some jobs and go, well, that's just wasteful. That's okay. This is meant for teaching. Where on say Niagara, if you submit a inefficient job, you probably get a a reply from one of our analysts saying uh, you should be more specific. Here, here it's fine. Just just try things out. If they if they don't work, that's fine. Uh, try something else. Um, it, by the way, and I don't think I've mentioned this. If you want to try things interactively with a number of nodes or some number of cores, rather than being on the login node where the, the timing differs. There's a, a useful command as well called debug job. I don't know why I didn't put it on the file, on the, on the slides. Um, and you can do dash n and then say how many cores you want. And what that does is it actually submits a job for you and then gives you a prompt. So if you notice, we're not on teacher one anymore, we're on teacher three, but I only have four tasks there, uh, which I get for a limited time. But it's a good way to try things out. Like I want to try out if new parallel is working. I want to see if it's if, if my syntax is correct. Um, and the syntax isn't correct, but it gives that that was on purpose. It gives me uh, some feedback right away. Um, those are some useful things to uh, to have. Dry run is, yeah, the dry run command, somebody's mentioning the dry run. That's that's pretty nice too, yes. So if you do dry run, uh, I forget if there's a dash or not. Um, what it will do is it will actually just show you uh, the commands it's doing, but not actually do them. So it's another way to make sure, say, for instance, your replacement strings have been done properly. It's a question, how can we give parallel more than one command if you are to use, um, do we do parallel first commands? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Oh, you mean two, two successive commands. So I think what you can do, let me try this. Uh, it's just do a semicolon. It's just like, yeah. So now these are actually two jobs, right? Running in parallel, you don't see it's parallel because they're so quick. Um, but they are each of them is doing two commands. Uh, one is an, an echo without a new line, and the other is just an echo. Okay, so that's it's kind of similar to the EOF command that they, uh, example that they had. The semicolon can be very useful there. It is important to have that in quotation marks. Uh, things become very strange if you if you leave them out.
Any more questions? If there are no more questions, I think we'll just uh, close it off. And I hope to see you guys on Friday, same time, uh, different Zoom link. And um, yeah, thanks for being here.